Welcome to the latest edition of Broadcasting Today. This evening we'll be talking to Henry Singer, documentary maker most famous for the 9-11 Falling Man documentary and Baby P. All part of our mission here at Middlesex University to teach students how to think differently, but more importantly, how to do. Welcome to the latest edition of Broadcasting Today. And today we've got somebody who I was desperate to call Henri Singer, but it turns out he's just <laughs> Henry Singer. But he's a great documentary maker. Made films like 9-11, uh, The Falling Man, uh, Baby Peter, uh, and The Last Orders here in Bradford. And it's a real pleasure to have Henry with us today. What I would like to ask you first, though, Henry, is um, here you were at Harvard. Then you were at Cambridge, and then of all the things you could have done to rule the world, <laughs> you actually decided to become a documentary maker. Why? Well, Kurt, funny you should ask. I, I, I nearly went on to be one of the people that ruled the world. I nearly went to business school when I was 26, and much to my father's disappointment, I, I stayed for one hour and uh, left. And I sort of asked myself, well, what did I want to do with my life? And it seemed that people that were either in journalism or filmmaking were doing by far the most interesting things. Uh, uh, among my peer group. Uh, so I started life as a print journalist uh, and after about a year and a half moved into filmmaking. And I guess it's, uh, it, for me it's been a fantastic fit because uh, I'm very curious. Uh, I'm very curious about the world. I'm very curious about people. And I guess I'm kind of old-fashioned too because I see documentary filmmaking as a kind of, as a public service. It makes me a bit of a dinosaur in today's mm -hmm. broadcasting world, and I don't go around to Channel 4 and the BBC and announce that loudly. Uh, but I do think um, really good films uh, take people places where they uh, think about the world and think about themselves in a, in a different way. And I, and I think of that as kind of educational. But obviously the great challenge is to not make it educational, but to just tell really strong stories and uh, leave people thinking, and they don't realize they're being educated they're just they're just drawn to drawn to the strong storytelling mm. who was the sort of inspiring sort of filmmakers that you you looked at to sort of help your work and make it look like the way it does well there were two there were two films that i saw before i became a filmmaker that really i remember saying to myself god what an amazing thing that would be to do for a living and one was a film that i'm sure every many people in the audience will have seen at some point uh, it was called 7-Up, 21-Up, I think, when I saw it. It might have been 7-Up, 28-Up. Mm. I don't know if, Enrique, you've seen it, but it's, it's every seven years a group of school kids in Britain were interviewed. Yeah, it was actually yeah, made yeah. by quite a famous uh, uh, now feature filmmaker, longtime feature filmmaker, I think, named Michael Apted. I think that's his name. I, I probably have that wrong. But, and I just thought, what an incredible uh, piece of work. Uh, um, and then the other one, which is probably less well known, was, were a couple films by a couple of brothers, American New Yorkers, one of whom only died in the last year. They're called the, Ma the Maisels Brothers. And they were one of the pioneers of kind of a cinema verite handheld, you know, taking the camera out into the world. Uh, and, they, and I was particularly struck by two films. One was called Grey Gardens, which was a, a sort of portrait of a very dysfunctional mother-daughter uh, relationship to sort of old ar aristocratic family uh, who were actually I think the mother um, was a first cousin of uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, okay. President yeah. Kennedy's. Mm. I'm, I'm telling you all this because I think your generation is probably not aware of all this. <laughs> yeah. And the other one, which I thought was the better film, uh, was a film called Salesman, which followed five Bible salesmen from Massachusetts oh. where I grew up to Florida and just followed them as they tried to sell Bibles door to door, mm. and one of them kind of lost, lost his mojo, lost his confidence, and had kind of a nervous breakdown. Uh, and I was, I found that absolutely fascinating. So both those films together, I thought, wow, people actually pay you to to yeah. uh, to do this kind of work, and that kind of, they were very inspirational in setting me on my career path. It's interesting you talk about Michael Apted, of course, because he kept with that seven up, fourteen up, yes. twenty one up, twenty. Uh, he's kept with it. And, one of and the he feels like it's, yeah. it feels like it's his baby, even though he's now probably in his late 60s, yeah, early yeah. 70s. He's, he's sticking with it. Totally. Until he, until he goes. I think the challenge of a film like that, and I haven't seen it recently, is, of course, 
over the, the lifespan of these people, you, you know, when I saw it was probably the best time. I think it was 28 up. Uh, or maybe, uh, yeah, I think it was 28 up. Um, but, you know, you, there was enough time to tell the backstory. Now mm -hmm. there's so much time to cover yeah. for each character that I suspect it's rather fleeting. Mm. But a, fa a fantastic idea and a fantastic couple films, the ones that I saw. Mm. What uh, motivates your search for subjects? I mean, uh, if, when you look at your work, you feel like a bit of a taboo chaser. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I, a lot of people are... Uh, I'm, I'm quite an amusing person, actually. <laughs> they probably won't come across this interview, but I do try to spend as much Just of my time. Just tell a couple of jokes to be fine. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 laughing. <laughs> but I. But everybody's always struck by how dark my subjects are. I mean, the Falling Man is about yeah, people who jump from exactly. the World Trade Center on 9/11. Baby P is about kind of the the tabloid aftermath of the murder of uh, this poor boy in in, in Harringay. Um, the film before that was about a mother who uh, killed her son. Um, I made a 90-minute film about a compulsive gambler. You know, a lot of my films kind of revolve around sort of death or destructive behavior. But I, I think the motivation is public service. It's not, it's not that I am a dark personality. It's more that I do think certain stories we need to look at, we need to examine, we need to learn from it. And I think I read a book. The first book I read when I got into television was called Entertaining Ourselves to Death. And uh, I mean, it's very outdated, but a very, very good book by a, a New York University sociologist named Neil Postman, who's probably no longer with us. But th that was very much about how USA Today, that newspaper, if you know it, was sort of uh, affecting lots of facets of culture. But that title has always stayed with me. And I do think so much of contemporary media is just about entertainment. And I actually think uh, that's a, that's that's. That's dangerous. There, there are stories we need to look at, we need to learn from, uh, and that, I, I think that's really what motivates me. Is, is uh, there was a term that uh, was used? Well, actually, it wasn't used in *The Falling Man*, but Tom Juneau, who wrote the article *The Falling Man*, which my film was based on, talked about the importance of bearing witness. We, you know, we need to look at these photographs. We need to look at these stories, and I feel that I feel that very much. Because when I look at your work. I mean, I know you say it's public service, but I think you're, perhaps you're underplaying yourself a little bit because actually you're a bit of a psychologist in a way. You're looking at the human condition. Yeah. And all of your films really strip away the layers and layers and layers of a character to get at the essence of the human condition. Isn't that really what you're about? Yeah. Which is, which is yeah. quite a difficult thing as a television-oriented program maker because yes. television doesn't like that complexity. No, you're absolutely right. And I, I do think... Um, uh, what I do is hard to pull off in this in c the contemporary media world because television likes him. The, I made a film a few years ago about um, uh, the murder of a of a white conservationist in Kenya named Joan Root. Blood of the Rose. The Blood of the Rose. Well done. And um, and uh, it didn't sell very well around the world. And I called up the distributor and I said, uh, uh, I think his name was John. John, why is you know why isn't the film selling? And he said, well, you know, people can't decide if it's a woman's film or if it's an environmental film or if it's an African film. And I said, well, it's all of them. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's, real, it's the real world. It, the world is complex. And he said, yeah, you know. And clearly people like simplicity. They like categories. You know, they like Donald Trump. I mean, you know, that's the kind of world we live in. So, uh, but I do, I do like context. I do like depth. Um, uh, my experience of life is that it's a complex endeavor. And I try to reveal that in my work, which is hard. It's much harder to get films off the ground where you're trying to tell a, uh, you're trying to tell a complex story. Uh, and it's much harder to make films that, that are still really engaging, have really strong narratives, but, but that are complex. It's a harder thing to pull off. So I, you know, I struggle. Don't, don't, don't kid yourself. It, ain't, it isn't easy. So let's go on. Let's talk about yeah. process. Go so on. in terms of like with, with documentary, there can be, you know what I mean, documentaries has to sort of, you have to get the audience straight away. I remember watching um, your 9-11 um, your Falling Man and I was thinking, because you went straight into it, like, I was thinking, what else or what more can you do? But like you were saying, how you sort of layered it. Like, what's the, what is the sort of the process of, of creating something that, you know, many people have probably seen and sort of looking at it from another angle that maybe no one else has seen? What's the sort of the process of that? Nice question, Henry. Good question. <laughs> I'm going to have to pause and think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 
Well, I mean, I think everybody has a different process. You know, yeah. I think every filmmaker has a different process. I mean, my process, I mean, you know, the, the short answer to that question is it's in the subject. Right. You know, I think every filmmaker is drawn to different subjects. And for me, I'm drawn to subjects that, as I said earlier, I think the, this is a story that needs to be told yeah. and that I actually think has has some depth and has some layers. It's not, you know, I, for me, it's not enough just to tell a good story. It has to be a really good story that also has layers of meaning. And, and that, so the, that's the big choice. You know, the big choice is what, what are you gonna, what are you gonna, what's the film about? And after that, you know, as I say, every filmmaker has a different process. For, for films like The Falling Man, the way I go about my process is I, I try to talk to anybody and everybody who's somehow connected to the story. Uh, you've always got the budgetary pressures, you know, you, yeah. you've got X amount of time to speak to everybody. So, you know, when I went to Kenya, I had something like seven weeks to put together a film on Joan Root. I'd never been to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, you know, I, I, when I got off the airplane, I didn't even know what the currency was because I was so busy, I didn't even have time to look it up. And I literally, I, I took two breaks. I watched the men's Wimbledon final and the women's win Wimbledon final. And I spent seven weeks working every single day. Mm -hmm. And I just, and The Falling Man as well, you speak, you speak to anybody or everybody you think has a yeah. connection to the story. And out of that, you start to see the film. And then you decide, well, who, who, who am I going to point the camera at to tell this story? And what questions am I going to ask them? And then, that, and then the, next step, the next step is doing that. The next step is thinking about the visuals. Yeah. But a documentary, even a documentary like The Falling Man or The Joan uh, Roots Murder in Kenya, you know, it's not till you get into the cutting room, into the editing process, that you really start to really understand what the film is about and how, and how to tell it. You know, yes, you've got the vague shape. Yes, you certainly have what you think is the fundamental ideas of the, or the fundamental idea you're exploring. But it's in the cutting room, which is unlike drama, I think, yeah. where, where films are really made. So that's a kind of longish beginning of an answer. Enrique's a very uh, straightforward man. He wants, he's got a cash question, I think. <laughs> yeah. Let's cut to the money, Enrique. Come on, man. It's all about the money, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when is it, when sort of is it in the process? Are you sort of like, yeah, we need, this is the budget we need. Is it, is it sort of while, before you've started filming or is that after? Like, when does cash come into it? Well, cash comes into it, as you can imagine, right at the beginning. Okay. Um, uh, because, you know, none of us, or very, you know, unless you've got a trust fund, uh, and there are documentary makers who uh, uh, have trust funds, um, but most people don't have the money to make, you know, The Falling Man would have cost 400,000 pounds. You know, none of us have that kind of money salted away that we're, and if we do, we're certainly not yeah. going to spend it on the film when you've got mortgages and kids and the rest exactly. of it. Um, so you put together a budget right at the beginning and you negotiate it uh, with the broadcaster. Uh, and you, and it's this back and forth where they try to knock you down um, and you try to say, look, at a certain point you knock me down anymore. I, I just can't make the film that, that we both want. Um, now that, that's, that's, when you, that's when you work for television. I'm at the moment also making a film and I've never made a film like this, on the trial of Ratko Mladic okay. uh, at the International Criminal Tr Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in Holland. <laughs> uh, he's, you, you're too young to remember this, but there was a kind of, uh, sort of bloody war in the 90s uh, mm. in the Balkans. And he is the Serbian general who many people think is responsible for the atrocities in places like Srebrenica that, uh, that you might have heard of. Now that's a film where I've been raising money as I've been making it. Uh, and that's much more the kind of independent filmmaking yeah. route where, you know, you start with a budget and you, and you can't sit around and wait to get all the money to make the film. And that's a much, and, and you end up making a film based on the money that you get. Uh, okay. Because, you know, the budget is probably 890,000 pounds. If we raise 700,000 pounds, we'll probably still make the film. I've raised something like 560,000 pounds so far. And that's a much scarier thing to do mm. because you're kind of walking a tightrope thinking, um, you know, Christ, am I ever going to get enough money to actually make this film? Yeah. And, and yet you're making the film as you're asking yourself those questions. When I made uh, Who Killed P.C. Blakelock, 90-minute documentary feature, it was an absolutely exhausting process, psychologically, technically. Uh, by the end of it, we're all c almost crushed. <laughs> you know? um, and... Do you think that students appreciate the sheer stamina you need to execute 
a documentary. I mean, in reality, I'm only about 28, even though I look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 12. Yeah. Um, I think students probably more than most people, uh, because I'm assuming some of them have tried to even make a short documentary. And I think when you watch a documentary go out, it all looks rather seamless, and it all looks kind of simple. You think, oh, wow, you just point the camera at someone, you ask them these questions. And I don't think, I don't think anybody, I think students probably have an inkling of it, have any idea how uh, uh, extraordinarily difficult it is. It takes enormous stamina. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of documentary makers have sort of broken marriages and the rest of it because mm -hmm. you have to be quite a obsessive, driven person to do it for a living because it, it's, it's, uh, it's incredibly hard work, um, actually. Where does the line between current affairs and documentary where is that line, do you think? Because your method is very journalistic. And long form in journalistic terms normally means current affairs. Mm. Documentary makers often see themselves as filmmakers, mm. whereas you are a bit of a hybrid. So where do you make the distinction between those Well, things? I think of myself as a filmmaker. Um, I think where I probably differ from some documentary makers is because I started in journalism and particularly American journalism, which uh, I probably shouldn't say this in front of the studio audience, but I just think is, 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 is a better product than British journalism in my experience. I've been living here for 25 years and reading the papers here, so that gives me some insight. Mm. Uh, but you know, American journalism is very, it, it's really based on this idea of objectivity that you try to take out whatever bias you have. And, just, and, and a lot of people find the New York Times just extremely boring and bland as a result. But I started in American journalism, and I, and, I, and I believe that really good documentary films have, as their foundations, a kind of a journalistic bent. In other words, somebody's gone out, and they've actually done real research to try to get to the bottom of something. Uh, but I think once I've done that, I try to make a film out of it, which is something where the journalism is invisible and where you're just lifted up and carried by a story in the, in the way you are with a feature film, and, and I think the best documentaries are as riveting as, as, as the best feature films. Um, I think where I'm, you know, the kinds of documentaries I, I like watching but don't aspire to are sort of the Michael Moore kinds of films mm -hmm. where you, you feel the agenda, you don't feel it's journalistic, you feel somebody has a particular take on their world and they're taking uh, stories and examples and statistics that actually buttress their and to me, those are more somewhere between essays and propaganda. Um, the Baby P film, which is my most recent film, is the closest thing I've done to a kind of news and current affairs documentary. And quite frankly, I'll never do it again. Interesting. Uh, because, because I well, because it really was too journalistic for me. And I think that film would have been better in the hands of a real journalist. It was kind of it was kind of investiga investigatory. And I think news and current affairs documentaries are really about facts in a sense. The Baby P film was about facts. You know, what exactly happened? Whereas I think films may have facts as a kind of foundation, but they're more about character and they're more about narrative. And my struggle with Baby P was trying to find character and narrative in a story that always had to go back to the, to the facts, to the journalists. <laughs> and, and I don't think that film worked on too many levels. It worked on just one straight journalistic level. I mean, that was part of the problem, was it? Not that you were talking to journalists the whole time, relying on their Well, I do relied on one, uh, uh, who you well, may Tim know, Donovan, Tim yeah. Donovan, who uh, was amazing. I, you know, I tip my hat to that guy. He's a, he's a hell of a journalist. But mm. he's, he, what he does is very different to what I do, mm. and I admire mm. him enormously. And we're, we're sort of on the same spectrum, but really at different ends of it. But unlike a documentary where you're talking to Brian, where you're trying to get into the man's soul. Yeah, you mean the street drinker the street I made the film on, yeah. Where he's not spinning. Yeah. Baby P, you had a sense as a viewer that you were being spun by a lot of these journalists, particularly when they said, oh, I'd rather not go there. Yes, yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. another story. No, no, I think it's a good question. Uh, let's talk about documentary as an agent of if you don't mind the long word, global cultural exchange. In other words, this is one of the few uh, devices, cultural devices we have at our disposal to really get across national boundaries. New, I'm a newsman. News is focused on a local, regional, or national audience, very rarely an international, or even the BBC World or CNN yeah. are really focused on the national audience. Whereas documentary, 
punches right through a lot of those boundaries. Do you think that's a, a good description of what documentary makers often aspire to? I do. I, I, absolutely, I do, because I think the best documentaries um, speak to something very fundamental and essential about human nature or the human condition or whatever the term you used earlier, Kurt. And, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, I don't know, Grey Gardens I mentioned about them. You know, that, that was essentially about a mother-daughter relationship. Now, it was strange. They were living in this broken-down house uh, with, they must have had 50 feral cats. I mean, it was despicable how they lived. This was this once great, rich, aristocratic family living in, what the house was called uh, Grey Gardens. And it, was, and it was extreme, and it was weird, but I think any mother-daughter watching that film would, would have seen themselves in it. Uh, and uh, uh, in my work, I, you know, you mentioned a Brian, the street drinker. I made a film also on a guy named James who was a compulsive gambler. Now, you know, you can make two films there. You can make a film that looks at James and Brian as freaks, you know, gamblers, street drinkers, ooh. Or you, you try, what I try to do is you try to make films that actually reveal that we're not that different, you know, mm -hmm. that, that there's a lot about James that, that I have, and there's a lot about Brian that, that's about me. And I think that's what really good films try to do. They, they get at something that's absolutely fundamental. I remember reading a quote about Arthur Miller's uh, Death of a Salesman, and when it was first sh uh, shown in China, and all these uh, Chinese men rushing up to Arthur Miller and saying, my God, you know, you've told my story. Now, there, there's the story of a, a father-son relationship set in America, and I don't know when it was, the 40s or 50s, and there you are in China, where males are saying, my God, you've put my story on stage. And, and you know, I think that's what, uh, and I'm not saying my films are art, but that's what art does. It actually, it does, it does speak to something very fundamental that can cross any boundary. And I think the best documentaries do do that. In other words, the best documentary makers have to be good therapists because they're the ones who really get down to the soul. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I would um, uh, describe all documentary <laughs> makers as good therapists. I could say most of them need therapy. I could, I could say that for you. But, uh, <laughs> but I do think documentary makers, good ones, are curious and interested in humanity. And I, you know, I think my my sister's a therapist, and I think there's there's an, there's absolutely an overlap in terms of uh, uh, of what we do. Mm. So would you say, like, being a documentary filmmaker, do you basically have to be nosy? Are you sticking? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think there's apps. My wife always says to me, she did, she just my wife comes from Poland, and she describes me as one of these a little old Polish ladies who's always pulling the lace curtain back and looking up. I'm, you know, I'm definitely a nosy guy. Yeah. You know, I'm curious about people. I, I look at the up, people that walk up and down our street in Harleston. Uh, uh, I think that the difference is, I mean, A, yes, you have to be no, nosy, but there are, you know, there are films that are nosy films, that are voyeuristic. Yeah. And I think it's about taking that curiosity, and if you put it in the right context, it isn't voyeuristic. The, the first film I made in this country was about... Um, sort of uh, how, how medicine treated dying people. And I, and I filmed a story of a gentleman in Arizona who was put on a machine. Uh, and, you know, it was a terrible story over eight days. And the, sort of the penultimate sequence was the mother and the daughter talking about whether they should pull the plug. And then the last sequence was the doctor and nurse saying to the two of them, look, there's nothing more we can do for your father, for your husband. I really think we, you know, that could have been a very voyeuristic thing. There you are watching people decide what to do with a human life. But in the right context, that isn't yeah, voyeuristic. Exactly. It's actually exploring some really important questions. Um, mm. But nosiness is the starting point for all that. There's no question about it. What would you say with like the balance of, you know, as well trying to be artistic, but at the same time trying to convey honesty, like a real message to a real audience like where where's the balance in that T the good question uh, I, and i think the balance is different for every filmmaker uh you know uh, i think ethics and integrity are a big part of this and everybody um uh, you know plays it differently depending on, on who they are and what their what their morals are uh you know it's it's easy to um let the beauty of a film 
or let's say the entertainment value of a yeah. film uh, to you, you know, it could be it could be the aesthetics, it can be ratings, it can be overwhelm what you know to be the mm. truth. Um, and so I think everybody balances them up in different ways. I try never to let what I perceive to be the truth fall away in the space of, oh wow, if we only cut it like that, it would be more sensational, and more people will be talking about it at the yeah. water cooler tomorrow morning. But we, you know, we're all pulled in that way it's because we're all trying to do something that's really engaging. But you, you, you know, you need to stick with what you know is is the truth. So making, you know, making something. Don't don't let the aesthetics overwhelm what you know to be the facts or the truth. Don't let the uh, don't let anything overwhelm it if you can help it. But I, I think I had a very disturbing conversation a few years ago with um, uh, uh, the women. Um, I have two women in Hampstead who. When, when you shoot interviews, you, you give them your interviews, Kurt knows this, and they type up the uh, transcript. So then when yeah. you prepare the film to go into the editing, you, you know, you've got it all there and you can pick bits out, etc. And they said, Henry, one of the reasons we like working on your films is that you always really represent your contributors, the people you put in the film, really fairly. And I said, well, is, is that not true of everybody? And they just rolled their eyes. And they, <laughs> and they basically said that a lot of people just kind of, you know, change what people say yeah. and, you know because it's a competitive industry and you know you're making a film and you want your boss to think it's great or you want it to get over two million or whatever it may be and I found that deeply deeply disturbing uh, because that's not that's not journalism you know that's not that you know you how what's the point of doing this unless you represent things honestly because we don't learn anything if it if we don't represent them honestly now, 9-11 was a big moment. I mean, big moment for the world, yeah. uh, culturally, but also a big moment in a way for c content creators, mm. documentary makers, journalists, yeah. because suddenly yeah. we recognised that the old world of linear television really no longer fitted in this new world of uh, abundant material. Yeah. You know, the digital space suddenly opened up everything. Do you think in a strange sort of way that's provided a new set of opportunity? You talked about raising money, crowdfunding or whatever other source you're doing it, raising money. Do you think that raises new opportunities for new documentary makers? In, in my generation, of course, it was going to the BBC, yep. you know, get kicked about by, you know, this executive producer, that executive, this editor, that editor, and you might come out with some crumbs. But now the opportunity is you go direct to the source, the audience. Yeah. yeah. Raise the money, make yeah. your film. Yeah, do you think that? I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. I think I think um, you know it's not just crowdfunding. It's these new small cameras that cost you know two thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Final Cut Pro, which no doubt members of the audience have used. You know, I think young people come to me and say, "I want to make films," and I say to them. You know, this is a this is the best time to do it because, and I, I say don't. Um, you know, yes, try to get a job at a researcher at a production company, and you know, and most of the jobs are working on, frankly, rather awful reality TV shows, etc. But I said, get yourself a camera, find a subject that really excites you, and just start making the film. And that's possible now. When I was starting out, frankly, I, this is how old I am. We shot on sixty millimeter film. <laughs> you know, you couldn't, you couldn't afford a camera, you couldn't afford film, you, you had to have a, DO, a, a director of photography, you had to have a sound recordist. Now, you know, everybody's making, you know, I, there, there's a film, um, a, not a documentary, a feature film that's gotten highly lauded. I, I actually think the director or the, or maybe the actress in it, somebody's been nominated for an Academy Award, it's called Tangerine, and the entire film was shot on an iPhone. Hmm. Now this is a feature, hmm. you know, with, with actors. Um, and you know that I mean I you know I could make a film on my iPhone six that I just got last week finally. Um, uh, so I think it's I think it's I think it's changed everything, and I think it's for the better. Mm. You know I think it's, it it means anybody can do it. You know as opposed to people that you know went to the right schools and you know their parents can afford to buy buy an internship for you all that kind of. I think it's fantastic. Here's here's my final question before we open up to the audience, and Enrique might have one more, but. You've talked publicly about your own need need to deal with cancer when it came up, the fear of cancer, which obviously when something like that happens to you, you have to dig really deep. And in a strange sort of way, it, I've been through the same experience, 
it suddenly reveals to you what you've been doing all these years when you're trying to break people down through your films, mm. as it were. Do you think that makes you, because you've still got 20, 30 years to go, it's going to make you a different kind of... Uh, uh, well, you know, we could, yeah. I was talking to Paul Kerr earlier, and you know, you can be making films at 80, who cares? Yeah. Do you think that's going to, going to help you become a more insightful and decisive filmmaker, that experience? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if the audience doesn't know, but I had something called Hodgkin's disease 12 years ago. I mean, I, I, I think my best work has come since I had cancer. <laughs> now, if you asked me why, I, I don't really know. I mean, you read stories of people who've had cancer and they, you know, they say, oh, after I had cancer, I decided to chase my dream and become a landscape gardener or I moved to the country or I did, you know, I didn't change who I was. I didn't change my profession. You know, I didn't, uh, but I think probably on some deep level in ways that I can't articulate, it probably changed me in a very fundamental way. And uh, I, I, I think my best work has come since then now, maybe I, I moved into my mature period, and that's why. I, I don't know. But I, I, you know, I, I mean, it's, very, it's, hard, it's hard really to articulate how an experience like that changes you. Or at least I've always found it hard to, to articulate it. Not that I'm, I'm completely open about it and very relaxed about talking about it. But I, I don't know. I guess it, maybe it just focused me a little bit more. Uh, maybe it helped me find my voice in a way that maybe I was struggling with before. Um, you taught me honesty actually taught me the absolute essence of a relationship with your subject is about trust mm. and you can't have trust without honesty and when you have to be really honest with yourself mm. you transfer that perhaps anyway that was yeah, my take that's, that's my take on it I, sh I should have asked you that question far, <laughs> far more interesting <laughs> <laughs> but you recently did you did the cancer ad as well recently yes, which, I did. which is which is really good and obviously that's one of your shortest sort of piece of documentary yeah. work what was that like? That was a really interesting experience. I, I did a series of uh, ads for Cancer Research UK, and I'm used to making 90-minute films, yeah. and most of these ads were 30 seconds. <laughs> so one thing that I loved was usually you have a viewing where people come in to watch your work, mm. and you know it's usually two hours of incomprehensible material. Here you had a viewing, it was 30 seconds, and it was over. It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, but I, I found it really, really uh, uh, so interesting to do. Uh, it's, I, and I think these ads are, I'm told by people in the ad world, kind of, uh, pioneering, they're, they're pure observation. Mm. Um, and uh, what, I, what I did find difficult is the way I make films, I build relationships with people. Mm -hmm. and I spend time with them even before I start filming. And here, it was like you arrived, you built the relationship in three minutes, and then you're filming a guy being told he's got lung cancer. And I, and I found that part of it difficult mm. because um, I felt slightly uncomfortable doing yeah. that. Not, not feeling I had a relationship with somebody, and then I'm filming this sort of the most extraordinary moment of their lives. Um, uh, so that aspect was, I found a little troubling, if I'm honest. But I, but I found the, the discipline of trying to tell a story or capture a moment in 30 seconds a, a, a really interesting challenge. And, and um, uh, I think they came out really well. I had a lot of, uh, you know, what I say when I speak to students always is documentary making is a deeply collaborative, and, and Kurt will know this, I'm sure it's true of news too, is very collaborative. So you're only as good as the people you surround yourself yeah. with. And I had some fantastic cameramen, fantastic editors, so uh, the director always gets credit for these things, but in fact, uh, they don't deserve all that credit. You know, it's, 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 it's really a collaborative medium. I was always happy to take it, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have some questions from the audience for Henry. Uh, just wait for that mic to come in over you. That's it. <clears throat> um, do you find, obviously, because you spend a lot of time making these films and things, um, that you get emotionally attached to some of the people that you have, who are involved in the films, or like the subject that you're um, making the film around? I get, I get um, really attached to the people. Um, uh, you know, it's you, sometimes. I mean, you always get attached because you become. My films are rather intimate. And so you can't help but get attached to people. And most of my films are about people that have had sort of a rough experience. And I've always kind of had a lot of empathy for underdogs or people who had rough experiences. So, uh, you know, you, you, you build up um, uh, friendships and connections. And, and often they carry on beyond the film. Sometimes they don't, you know, because friendships take have a natural course. But, the, the, for example, the... the um, 
film I made, I, be, I the, you know, I made these films on a compulsive gambler and a compulsive street drinker, and I became extremely close to both of them. Sadly, both uh, died in the last few years. I gave the eulogy at both their funerals, um, and they became real friends. Um, uh, whereas some people I've made films on, I, I feel very, very close to, but over time the relationship kind of peters out, partly because you, you only have so much time in your life to maintain friendships, is the truth of it, and partly because you've been thrown together um, to make a film, um, but then you, after a while you sort of go your separate ways. Um, but I always feel, certainly throughout, throughout the making of the film, and you know, for a year or two afterwards, I always stay in touch and feel very connected. And in some cases, I, you know, they're all on my Christmas card list, even people I've probably <laughs> lost touch with. Uh, and I, there is, you know, there is an issue also that people, it's a, you know, and if there are any students in the audience, I always suggest this book. Um, it's called um, The Journalist and uh, the Murderer. And it's, it's by a woman named Janet Malcolm, who's a very fine nonfiction writer in the United States who writes for a magazine called The New Yorker. And she writes very much about this kind of relationship between a, she talks about a writer and a subject, but it could easily be a filmmaker and a subject. And how you kind of, she, she argues that, that uh, journalists make their subjects feel, oh, we're making this film together. It's a deeply collaborative process. And then once they get the material, they kind of bugger off and make the film or write the book or write the magazine piece they want. And they, she considers it as a very exploitative relationship. And um, I'm always very mindful of that. Um, that that it's it's easy to veer into that if you're not careful, um, and uh, I think the thing to remember is that you know each party is doing this for their own reasons, and you need to be honest with each other while you're doing it about why you're doing it. So you avoid this this exploitative aspect, which is uh, which is always possible if you're not careful. Um. After the BBT film, uh, what's your view of well, the British press you've mentioned, but also regulation in terms of how can we correct the kind of things that, that we saw in that film? God, that, uh, that's the first question I feel is beyond my, um, <laughs> my it's out of my depth. I mean, I, uh, I certainly feel how in that particular story, uh, it was sort of shocking how the press behaved. And I don't mean just the sun because the sun kind of uh, led it. Yeah. But everybody piled on, uh, and not just the tabloids, but the broadsheets and the broadcasters. So it was a kind of, I think that film is kind of a critique of the British media in its, in its uh, uh, fullness. I, you know, so I can't even remember the name because my memory is so poor these days, but um, you know, the commission that was set up to look at... Um, Le Levison. Levison, Le you know, and I didn't follow it. I'm ashamed to say, you think, given what I do and how I've talked about this stuff, I'd have followed it really closely. But I have to say, I don't, I don't really trust the press to police themselves, quite frankly. I think, uh, you know, I think we... S that's, that's a classic example of, um, you know, it's a, it is about selling papers, fundamentally, and I... And I and I think a lot of the journalism in this country is shoddy. A lot of the journalism in America is shoddy. But I, I, I absolutely believe in independent regulators of the press because I don't think uh, there's a will within the press to regulate themselves. Now, please don't ask a follow-up question. <laughs> what, what, what? <laughs> because that's, cause that's, a, that, that's just an instinctive reaction. I, I, if anybody asks me anything of substance, I'll have to defer to, uh, to Kurt, who I'm sure has followed it closely. What I was going to add yeah. to that, actually, was that one of the things that sort of came out of the Baby P film yeah. was this idea that the decision of, was almost made uh, collectively through groupthink at the very beginning when the chair of social services went into that, uh, that first press conference. Press conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as it happens, I was in that press conference. Were you? I was covering it for BBC London. And one thing that shocked me was that I heard the chair of social services apologise. She actually used the word sorry. We're sorry for what has... Yes, so yes. she apologised at least twice, possibly three times. And then I heard this story growing, 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 yes, yes. saying that they she never, never apologised. Yes. And I couldn't figure it out. And it, it made me a little bit upset about the direction of yeah. travel and how journalists could so easily... Uh, 
create a narrative and then start to believe that narrative. Even though if you went right back to the original alleged sin, yeah. you would find that actually the story's not right. Yeah, yeah. Right from the very beginning, which of course was what Tim Donovan eventually did. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right about Unpacking your take it on it. Absolutely right. Anybody else? Paul? I was just going to ask uh, whether you know what your next project is. Yeah, I'm about to start a film um, in Rochdale about that, uh, you know, where the first story broke about the sort of um, Asian, I think the tabloids call it the Asian sex gangs, but the, the, the grooming of young mm -hmm. women, mostly young girls, mostly white, um, by uh, Pakistani men, mostly cab drivers and um, kebab uh, employees. Uh, and the BBC is doing a big three-part drama on it. Um, and they wanted a sort of companion 90-minute BBC One documentary. And so I'm starting that uh, as soon as we negotiate the budget to get back to <laughs> Enrique, who's interested in money, um, <laughs> you know, which is a, you know, we're trying, I'm trying to make it possible to make the film and they're trying to beat me down. But that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing next. That's going to be a trial of courage, isn't it? Because I think it's going to be hard. You, you've got communities there which really don't want to reveal the truth. You've yeah. got the, almost the ultimate taboo, um, which will be a real challenge going with yeah. BBC cameras. Well, the good thing is that there's a very <coughs> fine... Um, I think he's the chief investigative writer for the, for the Times. Oh, he's doing Sir Andrew Norfolk yeah, wrote he, the story. Do you he, know Andrew? Yeah, he won the uh, Journalist of the Year Award last yeah. year for that investigation. For that, exactly. So he's, I'm judge. not doing it with him, but he'll be in it. You know, <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah. and so the story, uh, you know, it's a bit like, it's not quite like The Falling Man, but it's not as though, I think the baby P, Tim Donovan's work, Tim Donovan did an exceptional work, but no one listened to it. Mm -hmm. They didn't pay attention to it because the baby P narrative was set in stone and people had moved on and uh, uh, and so in a you know that the film you know in a way broke new ground partly because nobody had listened to Tim before mm. whereas this story has had a public airing because because uh, Andrew's work mm. you know won awards and he kind of broke the story so I think it'll be I'm, well, I'm praying it'll be a lot easier than the Baby P film. Took him over a decade to break it, mind. Yeah. Because there was a lot of resistance. Well, he, to he it publicized. Yeah. Well, he told me you're right. He's, he sort of first came across it in 2002, 2003, mm. but he kind of dropped it, which which is, which is one of the things the film will explore. Mm. What was behind his instinct not to kind of pursue it? But he's a, he's an extraordinary journalist and, and I a think wonderful I know the guy. To that, but I'm not going to answer it here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, as you have uh, made documentaries in different parts of the world, how well did you conduct the research before actually traveling there? And has it ever happened that your ideas in the production has changed completely than what you have planned <laughs> in the pre-production? Yeah, <laughs> very good question. I, you know, the best example of that is this Kenya film, mm -hmm. which I think is a really good example of, Kurt was asking me about journalism earlier. Um, there, uh, there was an article in The Guardian uh, about um, deaths of white people in this area which some people in the audience will uh, recognize called the Happy Valley in Kenya. It's this kind of legendary place where in the 1920s um, sort of aristocratic uh, men and women went there and got drunk and slept with one another. That, that's its reputation. There was a feature film called I think White Mischief sort of about it. Um, and so it's always had, I think, a hold on, on this country, this, that, that, this happy valley, because it was, it's fabled in that way. How much of that is true, I don't know. But there's an article in The Guardian about the increase in numbers of white Kenyans who were being murdered in this particular area around this Lake Naivasha. And um, the, the, last paragraph, the second to last paragraph spoke about this woman, Joan Root. And I started doing research on it, because I thought that's quite interesting. This is a place where most of the roses that we buy for Valentine's Day in this country at places like M&S and Sainsbury's and Tesco's come from this one particular area. And she'd been trying to protect the lake. And she ends up being murdered for trying to protect the lake. Isn't that interesting? What we buy here might have played some role in the death of this woman, you know, halfway around the world. And I thought, you know, there's a rub there. There's an interesting film there. And I wasn't the first person to be struck by this because I discovered this article in Vanity Fair, which actually intimated that the flower farmers, the flower industry had had her bumped off, basically, because she was rattling the cages and she was hurting business. And The Guardian wrote a very similar piece. So I went out there and I sold the film on this idea, 
It was kind of like, I don't know how many people have seen Erin Brockovich, but it was like, you know, Erin Brockovich goes to Kenya. You know, it's this woman standing up against corporate mm -hmm. interests and, and in this case, paying for her life. You know, it was like a Hollywood film. And in fact, Working Title, which is the most successful mm -hmm. uh, movie company in this country, uh, had optioned the Vanity Fair piece to turn into a feature film with Julia Roberts. Mm -hmm. So I went out there thinking, wow, I'm going to make the documentary. And um, I knew very little about Kenya as I think I said earlier, including the currency. And the key in those situations is to work with local people who can very quickly uh, educate you and also can make sure you don't uh, end up in a ditch. Because I was told by more than one person, you know, you got to be careful. You stick your nose into the wrong place. It is the kind of place where you can end up in the ditch. Uh, anyways, to make a long story short, you know, after a few weeks of research, two, three weeks, it was very clear that the flower industry had nothing to do with her death. Um, and so the film entirely changed when I was out there. It became a much more complex uh, film, a, a more difficult story to tell, and on some level a less commercial story. You know, Vanity Fair, uh, working titles never made that film, and I think, I think it's because of the documentary. You know, the, doc you, yeah. the documentary basically, yeah, I, I sort of think I know who killed Joan Root. It was certainly not the flower farmers. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets back to the journalism. You do the research you know, and I, th you do the research and you and you try to get at the truth, and then you owe it to the audience to try to reveal what you've discovered, as opposed to falling back on what was in a sense of a, a sexier film, which is she was knocked off by, uh, you know, the evil corporate sector. Henry, we've run out of time, and we could keep going for another couple of hours, I'm sure, because you're a great storyteller, <laughs> uh, you know, as well as a great filmmaker. It's been an absolute delight to listen to you. It's been a delight to be and, here. And, and for being so open and honest about your craft. Can we give Henry a, a round of applause? <laughs>